Welcome to section 11.1 .1 on sequences for calculus two. So first we're gonna begin with the definition. A sequence is a function whose domain is the set of natural numbers. And the way we usually express a sequence or represent it is by writing a sub n. And notice carefully that the definition says the domain of a sequence is the set of natural numbers. So natural numbers are the numbers one, two, three, all of the positive integers. There's a little bit about, of debate about zero, but anyways, um, you can think of it as a of n being a function, right, of n. So all the values that get substituted in as part of the domain have to be natural numbers. We're not allowing all real numbers, rational numbers, or anything like that. Now, a sequence is a list of numbers, a sub one, a sub two, a sub three. So you represent which term in the sequence um, you're referring to by the subscript. And that also corresponds with the natural number that gets substituted in for n into the expression for the sequence. And the graph consists of isolated points whose coordinates would be one, a sub one, two, a sub two, etc. It can be finite or infinite. And we're just going to graph some arbitrary sequence for you to get a little idea. So here, this would be my n axis. And this I'm going to label a sub n. Those are all the sequence values. And I'll start, maybe we'll list about five points. And notice this graph, all of the points are going to be discrete. So I have a sub 1. There's just a single point somewhere, a sub 2. Maybe a sub three we'll put down there, a sub four, a sub five. So you get the idea. This is how we would represent the graph of a sequence. Now, let's move on to some examples of specific sequences and how we work with them. So first example, find a formula for a sub n. a sub n is called the general term. All right, so here they've listed out the first few terms of this sequence. So this would be a sub 1, right, our first term. This is a sub 2, a sub 3. And hopefully, as you look at the different terms, you can see a pattern for what's going on. This is actually a geometric sequence. You may have heard that before from your previous courses. But the most important thing to notice is that to get from one term to the next, you're multiplying by a third every single time. So that's your common ratio. Well, how would I give a formula so that someone could come up with the hundredth term or some general term? Well, I want to take one third, right, and raise it to some power. But I have to be careful because I want the first term to come out to be one. And I want the second term to come out to be one third. So I'm going to take one third and raise it to the n minus one. That way, it'll match all of the terms that were given for this sequence exactly. All right, and you can always check too, if you're not certain. So we could check here, if I wanna substitute in one for n, then we'll have one third to the one minus one, so that's one third to the zero, so that's one, and then a sub, let's skip around, a sub three, that would be one third to the three minus one, so one third squared, and that's one ninth. So everything checks out. All right, let's look at another example. Again, the directions are the same. So find a formula for a sub n, the general term. And this time the sequence looks a little different. The first term is five, then one, then five, then one, and so on and so forth. You can just expect the pattern to stay consistent. So this, this sequence is oscillating, right, between two numbers, five and one. And there's more than one way to represent this, but probably the cleanest way is by first identifying what the halfway point is between these two numbers. So halfway between five and one is positive three, so you could think of that as the midline. And then the sequence either takes three and adds two, or it takes three and subtracts two. That's how you get from one term to the next. 
All right, now how can I construct a formula in order to express this? Well, it looks like on the first, the third, the fifth, all of the odd terms I wanna add to, and then on all of the even terms, right? The second term, the fourth term, the sixth term, I wanna subtract to. So I need to either add to or subtract to, and I need the oscillation to occur based on whether I have an odd or an even term. So the way I do that is I'm gonna use negative one raised to some power. And remember the baseline is three, that middle line. So I have three plus, and I want the first term to end up adding two. So I'm gonna have negative one raised to the n minus one times two. And then this is gonna be our formula for the general term. So let's go through and break it down piece by piece. We start off with three. And then if I have negative one to the n minus one, then all of the odd number terms, negative one's gonna be raised to an even power, so it's gonna be positive, times two, so I'm gonna end up adding two. And then on all of the even number terms, n minus one is gonna be odd, so I'm gonna have negative one times two, so it's gonna end up subtracting two. And we can just double check and confirm by substituting in a few values for n, all right? So let's make sure for the first term, a sub one, that's gonna be three plus negative one to the one minus one times two. So that's gonna be negative one to the zero, which is one. So this is three plus two, which is five. Okay, looks great. Now let's make sure the second term still works. So if a sub two, we're gonna have three plus negative one to the two minus one times two. So negative one to the two minus one, that's gonna be negative one times two. So this is gonna be three minus two, which is one. And the pattern will continue. So that one is complete. Now, just to extend the problem, what if we had almost the exact same sequence, but notice I'm gonna change something up. One, five, one, five etc. Okay, so what I would want now is for the first term, the third term, the fifth term, all the odd number terms for two to be subtracted and for all the even number terms, the second, the fourth, to have two added. Well, I would just need that negative one to be raised to a different power. So what I would do is raise the negative one to the nth power and then times two, and then that would switch so that all of the odd number terms would end up subtracting two and the even number terms would add two. All right, good. Moving on, some more definitions. All right, so we say the sequence a sub n has the limit L if the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to L. And a convergent sequence is one that satisfies the condition that the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n exists. And that limit has to exist as a finite number. A divergent sequence is one where the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n either does not exist or it equals positive or negative infinity. So convergent sequences are only sequences whose infinite limit equals a finite number. Now we have some limit laws for convergent sequences, and you might notice that they're very similar to our limit laws for functions. The thing to remember though is that these limit laws can only be applied to convergent sequences. So we're only allowed to use them if we know that these sequences a sub n and b sub n are convergent. So we're allowed to distribute a limit over addition or subtraction, as well as multiplication and division, provided the denominator is not approaching zero. The fourth limit law is very powerful. We're allowed to take a constant times a sequence and bring it outside of the limit. The limit as n approaches infinity of a constant is just a constant. And I can also um, raise it to a power. All right. Next theorem, if the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n equals L, and f is continuous at L, then the limit as n approaches infinity of f of a sub n is equal to f of L. So what this means is if I have a continuous function, then I can pass the limit through the composition of that function with our sequence, all right? And this is gonna be very useful as we try to 
evaluate limits of more complicated or involved sequences. So here's an example to demonstrate. Example three, determine whether the sequence converges or diverges, and then if it converges, find L. All right, so to begin, I'm just gonna take the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n. So this is the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth root of two raised to the one plus three n. All right, looks good. Um, instead of writing the nth root, I can rewrite this as the limit as n approaches infinity of two raised to the one plus three n and then that quantity is raised to the one over n. And then using my laws of exponents, I can rewrite this now as the limit as n approaches infinity of two. When you have a power raised to another power, you multiply the exponent. So this is gonna be one plus three n times one over n or divided by n. All right, well, I'm noticing here, two, my base is a constant, right? So in order to evaluate this limit, I want to see where the exponent is approaching. So I want to pass the limit through. And 2 raised to some power, that's an exponential function that's continuous as n approaches positive infinity. So I'm allowed to pass this limit through to the exponent thanks to the theorem that we just considered. So this is equal to 2 raised to the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 3n over n. And then remembering when we take infinite limits, since the highest power in the numerator is equal to the highest power in the denominator, then I can just divide the coefficients of our leading terms. And so the exponent's going to be approaching three, which means now this all simplifies to two to the third, which is eight. And this is actually what L is, or our limit is equal to. All right. And now make sure you answer the question completely. It asks to determine whether the sequence converges or diverges. So we can say now, since the limit exists as a finite number, the sequence converges. Both parts are required for a complete answer. All right, that's looking good. Let's move on. Another theorem. If the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of a sub n equals zero, then the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n equals zero. This theorem is super powerful and useful, so make sure you remember the statement. And we're going to look at an example now on how to apply it. So example four, the limit as n approaches infinity of negative one to the n over n. Now, if I try to take this limit directly, negative one to the n oscillates, right? It's gonna oscillate between positive one and negative one. So I can't evaluate this limit because of that alternating term. However, what I'm gonna do is consider the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of negative one to the n over n. And when I take the absolute value of negative one to the n, that's just gonna end up giving me positive one. So this is the same as the limit as n approaches infinity of just one over n. And this limit I can easily evaluate as n goes to infinity, the denominator is getting larger and larger. So the terms approach zero. And based on this theorem, since I know that the absolute value of my original sequence, that limit equals zero, then I know the limit as n approaches infinity of negative one to the n over n must also equal zero as well. All right, let's look at a graph of what this sequence looks like to help reinforce this idea. Okay, so here's the n-axis. It's a little crooked, let's make it perfect. Okay, here's the n-axis, here's a sub n. Here's one, here's negative one. So here's a, my first term's gonna go here, second term, third term. All right, so a sub one, remember we're gonna substitute everything into a sub n equals negative one to the n over n. So a sub one is negative one, it's gonna be down here. 
a sub two, if I have negative one squared, that's positive one. One over two, that's a half, so that'll be here. A sub three, that's gonna be negative one third. A sub four, positive one fourth, then negative one fifth, et cetera, et cetera. So we see it's oscillating for sure, right? It alternates between being positive and negative. But since the terms are shrinking, the limit is still going to be going to zero. And I can see that because even if I were to take the absolute value of all the terms, so if I took the absolute value of a sub one and it was up here, and if I took the absolute value of a sub three and it was up here, we could still see that the terms are shrinking and approaching zero. All right? Good, moving on, the squeeze theorem for sequences. This is gonna be very similar to the squeeze theorem that you used for functions. So if a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n is less than or equal to c sub n for all n greater than or equal to n naught, and if the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n and the limit as n approaches infinity of c sub n both equal L, then the limit of as n approaches infinity of b sub n also equals L. So here's our sequence whose limit we're trying to evaluate. And if I can bound it by two other sequences who have the same limit, then I know that the limit of our sequence must also be the same. This is great to use for functions that can, or sequences that can be easily bounded. So what's the easiest kind of sequence to bound? Something involving sine and cosine, usually, usually. So here's an example. We're gonna figure out if the sequence is convergent or divergent, and we have a sub n, which is sine of 2n over one plus rad n. Now, if I were to just try to take the limit as n approaches infinity directly, I wouldn't be very successful because sine of 2n oscillates. Remember the graph of sine is a wave. So I couldn't proceed from there, but what I'm gonna do is use the squeeze theorem. So I can bound sine of 2n between one and negative one, right? Remember your graph of sine, its amplitude is one, so all values are bounded between one and negative one. Now what I wanna try to do is get this quantity in the middle to match my sequence whose limit I'm trying to find, all right? So what I need to do is divide through by one plus rad n. Now you have to be careful when you're working with an inequality, rad n is always gonna be positive, and if I add one, that's gonna be positive too. So I don't need to worry about flipping any directions of inequality signs, but consider it, okay? So we have negative one over one plus rad n is less than or equal to sine of two n over one plus rad n, which is less than or equal to one over one plus rad n. All right, so here's our sequence whose limit we're trying to evaluate. And this is basically a sub n from the squeeze theorem and c sub n. So I wanna take the limit of each of those sequences as n approaches infinity. And as long as I get the same value, then that's also the limit of our sequence. So let's see, the limit as n approaches infinity of negative one over one plus rad n, well, the denominator is just gonna get larger and larger. Numerator's a constant, so this is zero. And the limit as n approaches infinity of one over one plus rad n, well, same scenario, right? The numerator's a constant, denominator's getting very, very large. This is also zero. So what does this tell me? This implies that the limit as n approaches infinity of sine 2n over 1 plus rad n also equals 0, and you must state by the squeeze theorem. All right? So it's very important to remember, anytime you apply the squeeze theorem, you have to rewrite the original sequence with proper limit notation and state that you used the squeeze theorem. All right. Looks nice. Moving on to the next idea. Theorem. If the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, so now we're talking about a real valued function, equals L, and f of n equals a sub n, so that's our sequence where n is a natural number, then the limit as n approaches infinity of f of n 
is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, which is L. So what this basically tells us is if we have a function whose infinite limit is L, and that function can also be used to represent our sequence, but just remember now our domain is going to be the set of natural numbers, then they would have the same infinite limit. And this is going to be really useful so that we can apply additional limit techniques. So let's consider an example here. a sub n is equal to natural log of n squared over n. So just at first glance, when you're taking a limit, for sequences, we always take the limit to infinity. And I notice that the numerator is approaching infinity and the denominator is also approaching infinity as n gets very, very large. So I have an indeterminate form of the type infinity over infinity. And one of our first inclinations is to use L'Hopital's rule. But remember, we're only allowed to use L'Hopital's rule as long as both the numerator and denominator of our expression are differentiable functions. And we know that sequences are definitely not differentiable. The domain is a discrete set. It's the set of natural numbers. So what I have to do is define a function. I'm going to say let f of x equal, and then I'm just going to copy exactly the same sequence, but replace all the n's with x's. So then we're going to have the natural log of x squared over x. Now I'm going to consider the limit as x approaches infinity of this function. And I know from my theorem before, whatever the limit of this function is, it's going to be the same as the limit of our sequence. So this is the limit as x approaches infinity of the natural log of x squared over x. Again, as x gets arbitrarily large, the numerator is approaching infinity, denominator is also approaching infinity. So I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule. Make sure you indicate that you're doing so. So this is going to be the limit as x approaches infinity. Derivative of the numerator, so I'm going to use the power rule. I have 2 times the natural log of x. And then by the chain rule, I have to multiply by the derivative of natural log of x, which is 1 over x, over, and then the derivative of the denominator, the derivative of x is just 1. All right, so I can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 ln of x over x. All right, now let's investigate what's going on. So as x approaches infinity, the numerator is approaching infinity. The denominator is also approaching infinity. So again, I have an indeterminate form of the type infinity over infinity. So I can apply L'Hopital's rule again. And we have the limit as x approaches infinity. Derivative of 2 times the natural log of x is just going to be 2 over x. Over derivative of x is just 1. So now I can rewrite all of this as the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 over x. And if I have a constant over the denominators approaching infinity, this is equal to 0. So what does this all tell me? Well, basically now I can say, all right, based on our theorem, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the natural log of n squared over n, which also equals zero. So we would say this sequence converges. All right. Make sure anytime you do this, anytime you apply L'Hopital's rule, you first define a function f of x. Otherwise, your work is incorrect because L'Hopital's rule is not valid unless you have a differentiable function. So you cannot apply it to a sequence directly. All right, moving on. Another fact, say we have the limit as n approaches infinity of r to the n and r is between negative 1 and 1, then that limit is going to be 0. That should make sense because basically you're, to get from one term to another, you're multiplying by something smaller than 1. So the sequence is going to be shrinking, shrinking, shrinking from one term to the next, so it's going to get to 0 eventually. 
Notice when r is equal to positive 1, the limit as n approaches infinity of r to the n would just be positive 1, and that converges also. So here we have an example where we're going to try to apply this. We have a sub n, our sequence, equals 3 to the n plus 2 divided by 5 to the n. So let's see if I can rewrite it so I can identify what r that common ratio is. And I'm going to use my laws of exponents and break up the n plus 2 in the numerator and rewrite it as 3 to the n times 3 squared over 5 to the n. And now I can group 3 to the n over 5 to the n. And 3 squared, that's just 9, right? This is 9. So, rewriting my sequence, I have 9 times 3 fifths raised to the n. So, if you wanted to list out the first few terms to kind of get a feel for what's going on, you would have 9 times 3 fifths to the first, and then 9 times 3 fifths squared, so that would be 9 over 25, and then 9 times 3 fifths cubed, which is 27 over 125, etc. And you could see from one term to the next, the, they're always going to be shrinking, so the sequence is approaching zero. But how do we justify that? Well, we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of 3 to the n plus 2 over 5 to the n. And we know now we can rewrite that as the limit as n approaches infinity of 9 times 3 fifths to the n. And then, using one of our limit laws, I can take the 9 out side of the limit. So I have 9 times the limit as n approaches infinity of 3 fifths to the n. Since this r value is less than 1, then I know that that limit goes to 0. And you want to indicate that. This goes to zero, and here's our justification. Make sure you include that. So if that goes to zero, then we have nine times zero, so this limit is zero, and our sequence converges. All right, nice job. Couple more ideas, let's summarize before we add on. So. First summary, if you see that you have a geometric sequence, you have some common ratio raised to a power, you want to check if r is between negative 1 and 1 inclusive. That'll let you know if it's convergent or not. Squeeze theorem, that's especially useful for sine or cosine in a sequence. If you have a sub n divided by b sub n, where they're both polynomials, numerator and denominator, you can use L'Hopital's rule if you change everything to be a function of x, or you can just divide by the highest degree of the denominator. Now, new definitions. An increasing sequence is one where the first term, a sub 1, is less than a sub 2, is less than a sub 3, for all n greater than or equal to 1 increasing if the terms get larger. Decreasing sequence, if a sub 1 is greater than a sub 2 is greater than a sub 3 for all n greater than or equal to 1. A monotonic sequence is one that's either increasing or decreasing, meaning that all the terms are either going to be increasing for the entire domain or always decreasing, one or the other. Now we say a sequence is bounded above if there's some number h such that all of the terms are less than h for all n greater than or equal to 1. And the sequence is bounded below if there's a number lowercase m such that all a sub n's are greater than or equal to m for all n greater than or equal to 1. So basically all the terms are bigger than some number. A bounded sequence is a sequence that has an upper bound h and the lower bound m. So it's bounded above and below. And the most exciting part of all of this is our theorem here that says every bounded monotonic sequence converges. And I think the best way for you to really get a feel for that theorem is to look at a little graph. So we're going to graph some arbitrary sequence, but remember it's bounded, right? 
So when we say a sequence is bounded, that means it has both an upper bound and a lower bound. It doesn't matter what they are. So we'll say here's H, our upper bound. All the terms have to be less than H or equal to it. And then our lower bound, lowercase m, I'll just put it here, okay? So our sequence, a sub n, I don't know what it's doing, but it lives between h and m, okay? It's only allowed to live in there. And then the other part of the theorem says this sequence is also monotonic, meaning it's either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. So pick a point to start. It doesn't matter where. I'm going to call that one a sub 1. Say it's strictly decreasing. That means I'm only allowed, when I move to the next term, to decrease. Well, there's no way for this sequence to not converge or to not have a limit as n approaches infinity if it's bounded. It can't do something crazy like spiral down towards negative infinity because it's bounded below by lowercase m. What if you started off somewhere else, maybe down here, and the sequence was increasing? Well, again, if it's strictly increasing, it, since it has to be monotonic, it doesn't have the option of going back down. It can only keep getting larger and larger, so the limit would be capital H. But notice you need a sequence to be bounded both above and below and be monotonic in order to apply this theorem. All right, so let's see how we can apply it. Consider the following sequence a sub n, which equals 1 over n. The terms are as follows, if you want to list out a few to get a feel for it. 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth. Now, a sub n is bounded. If I'm going to make a statement like that, I need to find what the upper bound and lower bound are. Well, it's bounded above by 1. Because that's the largest term that the sequence can ever be. And it's bounded below by zero, right? There's no way for me to get a negative term for a sub n since I'm only substituting in the natural numbers for n. Also, this sequence is monotonic because it's strictly decreasing. This means that it converges based on our theorem. In fact, we know that the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to zero. Now, what if I didn't have all three of those conditions? Say I considered the following sequence, a sub n, which equals negative one to the n plus one. Well, let's list out the first few terms. So if I substitute in one for n, that's gonna be negative one to the one plus one, so negative one squared, which is one. Then the next term would be negative one, then one, then negative one, etc. Is a sub n bounded? Can you find an upper bound and a lower bound? Absolutely, yes, it's bounded. It's bounded above by one, right? It's never gonna be larger than one. And it's bounded below by negative one. However, is it monotonic? One, negative one, one, negative one. It switches from increasing to decreasing, which means a sub n is not monotonic. Which means that a sub n does not converge. In fact, it diverges. And if you wanna see this, this one's a pretty fun one to graph because it's just gonna be bouncing between one and negative one. Right, so here's n, here's a sub n, here's positive one and negative one, and all it's going to do is just bounce between those two. So it'll be at positive one for the first term, one, two, three, four, five, then negative one, then positive one, then negative one, then positive one, etc. So as n approaches infinity, you could see the sequence isn't leveling off, it's not approaching any finite number. All right, last example here. Determine whether the sequence is increasing or decreasing or not monotonic. Is it bounded? All right, so here we have a sequence a sub n which equals 2n minus 3 over 3n plus 4. 
Well, last time we had a really easy sequence, just one over n. We listed out the first few terms and we could clearly see that it was decreasing. Let's try listing out the first few terms here and see what happens. So a sub one, if I substitute in one for n, that's gonna be two minus three over three plus four. So that's negative one seventh. And then a sub two, that would be four minus three over six plus four. So that's one tenth. A sub three is six minus three over nine plus four. So that's gonna be three over 13. A sub four, it's gonna give us five over 16. So it's not super obvious what's going on here. What's another way that we could test whether something's increasing or decreasing? Well, from Calc 1, we know that the first derivative gives us information about where a function's increasing or decreasing. But again, I can't take a derivative of a sequence. It's not differentiable. So similarly to when we wanted to apply L'Hopital's rule, I'm going to consider a function f of x, and I'm going to let it equal 2x minus 3 over 3x plus 4. All right, so redefine your sequence now as a function. This is going to be differentiable. So f prime of x is equal to, so let's say I need to use the quotient rule. I'm going to have 3x plus 4 times derivative of the numerator. That's going to be 2 minus 2x minus 3 times derivative of the denominators 3 and then square the denominator. All right. So cleaning up the numerator, we're gonna have 6x plus eight minus, if I distribute three, that's gonna give me a 6x and then a positive nine over three x plus four squared. And this ends up being a really nice derivative because six x cancels out. So I just have 17 over three x plus four squared. Well, what can I say about this derivative? The denominator's squared, so it's not gonna be negative, and the numerator is a positive constant. So this is greater than zero for all real numbers. Well, what does this mean about our sequence? If the derivative is positive, that means my function is increasing, strictly increasing since it's never equal to zero. So my sequence a sub n, 2n minus three over three n plus four is increasing. You could even say strictly increasing, meaning it never is constant. All right, now let's go back to the problem and see what else it asks. So we determined that the sequence is increasing. Is it bounded? In order to answer that question, I have to find the upper and lower bound. If I'm unable to do so, then I need to show that the sequence either approaches infinity or negative infinity by taking a limit. So let's see. The sequence is increasing then that means automatically I have the lower bound. The lower bound is gonna be the first term because the sequence keeps getting larger as you move to the next term. So lower bound, I got it. It's just gonna be a sub one, which is negative one seventh because it's increasing. Great. What about an upper bound? Can I find one? Well, let's consider the limit as n approaches infinity of the sequence of 2n minus 3 over 3n plus 4. Well here, as n approaches infinity, I look at the numerator and the denominator. This is first degree in the numerator, first degree in the denominator, so I can just divide the leading coefficients and this limit is going to be 2 thirds. So that means the sequence is approaching two-thirds as n goes to infinity. It will never achieve that value of two-thirds, so that's our upper bound. So since I was able to find both an upper bound and a lower bound, that means my sequence is indeed bounded. All right, so be sure anytime you use the derivative to check if a sequence is increasing or decreasing, you redefine it as a function and in order to prove or state that it's bounded, you need to find both the upper and lower bounds. That concludes section 11.1. Stay tuned for 11.2.